Okay, we are now live. Th again, thanks to everybody um, for being on the line today. My name is Ann Hand. I am the Senior Program Manager for Equity and Leadership Initiatives at Hispanics in Philanthropy. And um, I am just thrilled to have our exciting panel um, today talking about um, our efforts at HIP to um, improve data for a culture of health um, for grassroots Latino nonprofits. Um, for those of you, there we go. And again, a special thanks to today's presenters, um, Denise, Cassandra, Carissa, and Melissa, um, who are going to be talking about the, um, the background um, related to this tool and then um, some user experiences as we did the pilot um, several months ago. For those of you who um, are not so familiar with HIP, um, Hispanics in Philanthropy is a transnational network of foundation leaders, corporate leaders, and social entrepreneurs dedicated to strengthening the Latino community. Um, we focus on the Latino philanthropic ecosystem, so that means foundations, nonprofits, um, individual investors, leaders, um, communities, that the, the range, um, the broad range of individuals and entities that, um, that create activities and projects um, to benefit the social good for Latino communities in the U.S. and throughout the Americas. Um, HIP is a 32-year-old U.S.-based nonprofit, um, and in those 32 years, we have supported many capacity-building activities, um, increased funding for the Latino civic se sector, and advocated for increased diversity um, within the phil formal philanthropic sector. So very briefly, um, today's agenda is looking at the tool that we've developed um, around a culture of health for Latino grassroots nonprofits and Latino communities, um, thanks to Denise, who will be speaking um, to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and our um, partnership with them uh, to create this tool. Um, then we'll go a little bit more into the tool itself, um, what it does, um, how it works, and then um, some individual organizations' um, experiences piloting the tool. And with that, I will give the mic over to Denise. Um, and Denise, I will be moving the slides, so um, if there's anything that um, you need moved, please let me know. Denise, you, your audio should work now. Great. Thank you, Anne. So in 2014, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary declared culture its word of the year because people use it so broadly. Culture can mean art and music, it can mean history and heritage, but basically it boils down to this. Culture is how we do things. How we do things within our families, within our communities, within our workplaces, and how we do things as a nation. When we at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation talk about building a culture of health, it means recognizing that health is an essential part of everything that we do. Now, as you might already know, RWJF has spent the past 40 years working with people to take on the major health and healthcare issues of our time. So what's different now? What is a culture of health and why do we need one? Next slide, please. Consider this, culture filters every aspect of our daily life. It's what we think and feel. Culture is how we learn and teach. It's how we relate to one another. Now picture if being as healthy as you can be was part of our everyday culture, baked right into the very core of our American existence. What if claiming, reclaiming, or sustaining health was a priority for everyone, no matter how much money you earn, where you live, what you do, or where you came from? That's what we mean by a culture of health, and we are striving to build a national culture of health that will enable all of us to live longer, healthier lives now and for generations to come. Now, this is a big, diverse country made up of people who define health in different ways. Health means something different to each of us. But we all know one thing for sure. Being as healthy as we can be helps us lead more productive and prosperous lives, and that is something we should all value. Good health gives people the opportunity to be their best, to fulfill their potential, and to thrive in an environment that supports their goals for themselves and for their families. Caring about health builds neighborhoods and cities with green space and public transportation. Good health means reducing violence. 
and it means making sure that our kids can enter school strong and ready to learn. To make that vision, a culture of health, a reality, we have to do more than just think big, we need to act big. And data is one way to help us move toward action. Next slide, please. In today's world, health is often, too often I would say, tied to how much money people make, how much school they've completed, and, how and which neighborhoods they live in. People's health has a lot to do with individual decisions they make, that's for sure. But the choices that we make are based on the choices that we have. When young children experience poverty, hunger, or domestic violence, we know they are more likely to drop out of school, end up in prison, or become addicted to drugs. When a community doesn't have safe places to socialize, air that's unfit to breathe, or water that's unsafe to drink, people have a hard time making healthier choices. Health will always be linked to healthcare, but we are beginning to acknowledge that it's also influenced by social factors like how safe our neighborhoods are, how strong and supportive our families are, and how invested we are in our communities. But just by knowing this, has still not led to widespread progress. It hasn't led to broad collaboration or equity in health. Nearly one-fifth of all Americans live in low-income neighborhoods that make it hard to be healthy. Places with inadequate housing, high crime rates, pollution, a lack of job opportunities, and little access to nutritious food. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Did you know that in America, your zip code at birth might be as important as your genetic code in predicting how well and how long you live. Next slide, please. If we look at a map of Chicago's rail system, babies born and raised downtown in the loop can expect to live about to about 85 years old. But if you happen to live just eight miles south of that in Washington Park, where the unemployment rate is 23% and 39% of households live below the poverty line, you are more likely to die up to 16 years sooner. And unfortunately, this is not unique to Chicago. If you look across the country from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, you'll find the same startling statistics, with some places where the contrast is as high as 20 years. 20 years of someone's life cut short just because of where they were born. As a nation that prides itself on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all, we simply cannot tolerate health disparities like this. I don't know about you, but if this data and this visual don't help build a compelling case for why, and we sh for why we should care about health disparities, then I don't know what will. As a researcher, I believe that the biggest rule of data is this. Measurement only matters if it changes the way that we act and drives action. Data can help us tell a story a story of why a solution to a problem is needed in a community. Data can help tell a story of success for how an intervention is working well within a community, within an organization, within a school, or within a program. Stories are universal. Our brains can more easily store data when told in story format, because stories are often communicated in everyday language and terms that most people can relate to. And stories can be shared with others. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Building a national culture of health will take unprecedented collaboration. Everyone has a role to play, and we know that a cultural shift is going to take some time. We need to keep working to change our culture into one that values health, promoting, sustaining, and safeguarding it everywhere and for everyone. That's why RWJF is working with communities, policymakers, businesses, and others willing to find ways to advance this movement. Building a culture of health calls for action within and across sectors, because progress in one area will help us to advance progress in another. The good news is that as a nation, we're recognizing that we need to change directions. We started looking for new roads, pathways that will broaden our concept of health and lead us to better and more integrated ways of improving it. This action framework that you see here will help guide our work and our investments over the next 20 years. It is intended to be a broader framework for the nation, including actions that we do not necessarily fund. This Culture of Health Action Framework was designed to build on the energy and the legacy of those of you who have already worked tirelessly in the health arena for many years. This framework also opens the door to new allies, 
especially those who haven't realized their, their role in health until now. That's why we call it a framework and not a model. You'll see that it doesn't have a lot of boxes and arrows. Rather, this framework serves as a rigid blueprint that will invite individuals, organizations, and communities to see how their own goals and priorities align with the goals of others. We hope this framework and the culture of health movement will spark a productive national conversation about the physical, social, economic, and emotional conditions that influence health. This is a really big task, but we know that Americans, um, when we put our minds to it, together we can accomplish anything. It may take us a generation to achieve, but we're committed to seeing it through. And like I said, this is a 20-year investment for us. And we hope that you will, enjoy it. you will join us as ambassadors of this movement. When you look around, you'll see that a, the idea of a culture of health already exists. You can see it at local farmers markets. You can see it when your neighbors take a power walk after dinner. And you can see it at places like CVS, where they stopped selling tobacco and they started giving flu shots. The seeds of a culture of health have already been planted. Next slide, please. So in the years to come, no one in America should feel as if better health is beyond their reach. Data about your community, region, or organization's impact is essential. It improves fundraising. It creates trust and credibility. We all have opportunities to grab data, yet we often don't make the most of the data that we have. So we've worked with our partners and grantees to develop a variety of free resources and tools that are available to the public. I've highlighted just three of them here today. At cultureofhealth.org, you can find out more information, including short stories and inspirational videos about the Culture of Health framework I just mentioned. I encourage you to visit countyhealthrankings.org, where you can see your, how your community ranks when it comes to health. This website has a variety of customizable, printable, and shareable tools. They're all free as well. There are also opportunities to request coaching or technical assistance for using the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps tool. Lastly, at diversitydatakids.org, you can explore measures of child well-being and policy analysis from credible sources that document things like diversity, opportunity, and equity among U.S. children. Our colleagues at Brandeis University also offer a variety of webinars and other resources. So thank you so much for allowing me today to share with you our Culture of Health vision. And now I will pass it over to Cassandra. Thank you, Denise. Before we, we pass it over to Cassandra, who will go into um, more detail about the benchmarking report that um, she created to look at HIP's capacity building tool for Latino nonprofits, I wanted to take a minute to provide everybody on the line with a little more detail about this tool. I think that Denise did a fantastic job of outlining the way that we can all work together to create a culture of health. And one of the things that we see in the nonprofits that Hispanics in Philanthropy has the honor and privilege of working with is that while the stories are always powerful, quite often the data that supports these stories could be stronger. And so what we've created is a self-guided online tool for grassroots nonprofits in particular to improve and track their data and communications capacity. This is a free tool that is accessible for anybody, not just Latino-led, Latino-serving nonprofits at sdh.hiponline.org. But since our focus is on the Latino community, we wanted to create a very specific bilingual tool that we knew we could validate with Latino grassroots nonprofits. I'm going to share very briefly with you um, the three steps that the tool has. The first is an organizational capacity assessment for each nonprofit that chooses to partake. Um, there are four different sections looking at different management processes and procedures. And then once an organization completes the survey, they're directed to their results as benchmarked to our broader database of organizations. And from there, the tool recommends specific resources in the different categories um, where the tool has indicated that 
the organizations could use perhaps some extra help, extra resources. The organizations are then able in the future after reading, understanding, perhaps changing some internal processes to retake the survey, to redo their organizational capacity assessment and track their improvement. And now I will pass it over to Cassandra, who will speak to a report that we issued last year looking at this tool and benchmarking it against other self-driven online tools. Uh, my apologies, I'm having a technical difficulty. Could you confirm that you can hear me now? Okay. Okay, I wanted to thank you, Anne, for inviting me here today, um, as well as Denise for an excellent overview uh, of the culture of health and the need for building the culture of health. Um, as Anne mentioned, last summer I worked with Hispanics in Philanthropy on a study benchmarking the types and features of different available capacity assessment tools um, that nonprofits have available to them uh, when they're looking to boost their data capacity. Um, today I'll present a short overview of the objectives, the methodology, the findings, and some of the recommendations of that report with you today. Uh, next slide, please. So why data? Uh, I think Denise really made the case the most compellingly. It, it's really about giving uh, us the information that we need uh, to create this culture of health, which means uh, the data that will really help people uh, to build their awareness around social determinants of health more broadly and how it impacts their lives, um, to provide people with the data that they will need to make the decisions uh, to change health behaviors, um, the data that local policymakers and community organizations that are looking to influence local policymakers uh, that, that they need, um, as well as, and maybe in slightly less compelling, but um, the data that is now required so much for funding and for reporting uh, reasons. Um, the, tip, the HIP tool, as Anne pointed out, uh, is meant to assist organizations to look at their uh, capacity for data collection and communications. It provides some resources for nonprofits who want to address areas of opportunity where they can further develop this, this data collection and communications capacity, as well as, um, and something Anne didn't mention, but Organizations can do this type of assessment over and over again to really track their institutional development in terms of data capacity. Uh, so why this benchmark? Uh, HIP worked with a number of organizations to create and pilot this tool based on an identified need, um, but, but there was a desire to kind of step back and see to the degree to what extent um, the tool was really addressing a gap uh, in terms of the types of capacity assessment tools that were available, assessment tools related to social determinants of health, as well as tools that were really targeting Latino nonprofits. Um, the other idea was really to identify potential areas of further development. Uh, so how could the tool and how could HIPS work generally in capacity building for SDH data uh, could be continued. Next slide, please. So how did we go about this? Well, we started with a quick scan of the available capacity assessment tools that are out there for nonprofits and non-governmental organizations. And quickly we realized that there were a large number of tools available. Um, and in a non-exhaustive list, we identified around 50 such tools. Um, what we did realize very quickly, though, is that though these tools were called capacity assessment tools, the degree to which they actually focused on data uh, was highly variable. We did eventually identify three types of assessments that did have some kind of data capacity um, focus. 
The main one we're monitoring and evaluation capacity assessment tools. A secondary one, uh, which is less pre prevalent, are research activity and capacity tools. Um, and then there are some general organizational capacity assessment tools, which do have some focus on data. Um, but what we saw very quickly uh, was there wasn't a tool like the HIP tool that was really looking at data in a more holistic way. Um, monitoring and evaluation is much more focused on a, an audit and accountability. Research activity is really looking at the extent to which research uh, community-based organizations are prepared to undertake research generally with public health researchers. Um, and then the general organizational capacity tools brush very lightly over data capacity issues. Um, but we did uh, end up identifying a few tools that uh, merited in-depth review. Uh, we identified six self-assessment tools and two guided assi or assisted assessment tools um, that were worthy of mention and then of further, uh, further looking. Uh, next slide, please. So the final list, we looked at three monitoring and evaluation tools, two, two tools that were used uh, with, with the health sector, but mostly in developing contexts. One tool that's used in the health sector, in particularly the HIV awareness sector in, in the Americas, and particularly uh, with a special interest group, which is the Asian American population. Uh, in terms of the research capacity um, act and activity assessment tools, uh, these are two tools that were developed by uh, US-based university centers that work with community-based organizations on research activities. Uh, one is based at the University of at Yale University and the other one at NYU. Um, finally, we looked at two general organizational tools that are very well known in the nonprofit sector. So the McKinsey Organizational Capacity Assessment Tool as well as the Innovation Network Organizational Assessment Tool. Why? We wanted to see if there are any more technical features uh, that would be interesting that could be eventually uh, adapted in the HIP tool. And of course, we benchmarked this against the HIP tool. Um, to see how the HIP tool uh, measured up with these other types of tools that existed. Next slide, please. Uh, what we quickly saw was the HIP tool was the only tool that was really focused on social determinants of health. So in our shortlist, we took two general tools, but also the, the rest of the tools were focused on health-related uh, sectors. But the only one that really looked at social determinants of health was the HIP tool. Um, it was the only tool that's a dynamic tool, so online, available, just in time, that has a focus on data capacity. The only other two online tools were the general organizational assessment tools. Um, so this was definitely a, a plus. It was the only tool that we saw that, that really focused on Latino nonprofits. There were two tools that, that were more focused towards the Asian American population but uh, and CBOs, but no other tools really were looking uh, to serve Latino nonprofits who are working on these SDH uh, issues, whether it be advocacy service or activities. Um, it was also very interesting to look at the way it, it approached the data capacity issue. HIP was the only tool that really considered data capacity not only within the organization, um, but also amongst different stakeholders, ranging from volunteers to ben beneficiaries. And when we're talking about building a culture of health, this is actually an integral part of, of an organization's data capacity. To what extent are they able to communicate uh, and empower organ uh, communities to work with this data. It was also the only tool that really thought about how supervisors and managers were using data to drive decision making. Um, so it's more of a focus on data demand and use and not just purely collection uh, and, and box ticking. It's really how does the data uh, in, impact the organization's uh, mission and activities. Uh, and then on a more technical level, it is the only tool that we saw that, that was uh, conceived for viewing on smartphones and tablets. Um, it, it's 
the HIP tool was actually one of three tools that provided the fully automated results. Um, it was one of two tools that included the possibility of benchmarking against peer organizations. Uh, and it's the only self-guided tool that actually has this possibility of benchmarking against other peer organizations. Um, and then it is one of two tools, the other one being the McKinsey tool, to actually use rubrics so as a scoring system. So it gives more information to organizations as they're going through this process of self-assessment um, uh, about how they can measure themselves against the scale. Um, next slide, please. In terms of recommendations and further development, I think we can really split the, the recommendations up into two uh, distinct groups of recommendations. One is really about the questionnaire and how do we really think about data capacity, uh, what, what aspects uh, what other aspects of data capacity could be included in the questions that are included in the tool. Um, and then the other aspect, of which we'll come back to in a minute, is, is really how can HIP um, continue its, its support for data capacity building within uh, on social determinants of health with Latino-led, um, Latino-serving organizations. So in terms of uh, the way uh, and what we consider in terms of data capacity, some of the things that the tool could potentially be expanded to include would be looking at how organizations handle ethics and data privacy and confidentiality issues, what kind of standards um, the, the organization use in terms of monitoring individual behavior changes and, and how community level disease trends evolve, uh, the categories of data that are used and how it's treated. Um, training and methods, and alignment with sources of government data. Um, so those are areas in terms of how the questions could be expanded and organizations can um, continually evolve in terms of uh, the, the types of data capacity uh, they're looking to develop. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, the other set of recommendations is really about additional data capacity building uh, activities that HIP uh, and its, uh, the organizations it works with can engage with. Um, in terms of boosting uh, the assessment tool, one, one quick win would be potentially offering guidance and notes and general introductions for organizations uh, before they decide to undertake any kind of data capacity assessment, as well as some guidance as they're looking to plan out their actions after the assessment. Um, more generally, and as Denise mentioned earlier, um, Certainly, uh, the organizations that are working on this uh, question on the ground, as well as HIP, uh, will, will obviously need to work on a common understanding of what capacity uh, in the use of social determinants of health data means, uh, what it includes, uh, so that everyone can work together in terms of um, moving towards the, the same ultimate goal. The resource library that's already integrated in the tool is an excellent basis. Uh, for NGOs who are looking to build capacity, but certainly additional web resources could be added uh, to support organizations in their, in, in their pursuit of better data capacity. And then there are different types of other assessments that an organization can undertake. Um, so one would be the individual level capacity assessment where they actually, uh, instead of looking at the organization, they look at how individuals such as managers are equipped to really go and uh, make decision making uh, data based. The other one is of course to look at uh, the skills and the knowledge of individuals who are responsible for data collection, monitoring, evaluation, or research, uh, and look at ways in which that could be boosted uh, to improve and to enhance the organization's overall uh, ability to use data for uh, to drive its mission. Um, that's an overview of the tool. I want to thank you all for your attention and I look forward to your questions during the question and answer session. Thank you, Cassandra. I'm going to put you back on mute for now. 
the next uh, two panelists um, are leaders at their organizations, and they um, were key stakeholders as we piloted this tool and really validated the concept. Um, their organizations um, are very different and located in, in different parts of the U.S., and um, right now I will hand the microphone over to Carissa Aranda from the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. And Carissa, can you hear us? You should be able to speak if you're still having technical problems. We can start with Melissa and work on the back end to make sure that your audio is connected. So I'm not hearing Carissa. Um, let's unmute Melissa and see if she is able to speak to Puertas Abiertas experience while we were working on the Hi, back Anne. end. Hi, Melissa, are you there? Yes. Great. Yes, I'm here. Okay, so um, I, I hope you don't mind changing the order. We're going to no, no, no. work to correct Chris's audio. Um, so please take it away, Melissa. Of course. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, the tool has proven to be very, very helpful. Um, I will start off with a little bit of who Puertas Abiertas is, and for those that you don't know, we are located in the beautiful Napa Valley. And Puertas Abiertas directly translates to open doors, um, so we try to live by our name. We were born out of the need of the community. We became a nonprofit 10 years ago with the assistance of several community members. And since then, we have grown to serve over 1,500 individual clients a year with a staff of four and many, many dedicated volunteers. As a community resource center, we focus on serving the community with whatever they may need. Uh, the past couple months, we were busy helping clients with unemployment applications as harvest ended and they were out of a job. Um, in, January, in January, we partnered with several banks, um, the California Human Development Corporation, uh, the U.S. Department of Labor, and the Workforce Investment Board to put together a job fair where we had resume building workshops, information on retirement benefits, how to, success, how to have a successful job interview, and assistance on running a small business. Uh, currently, we have our Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. Last year, we helped 190 people whose average gross income was $20,000. Um, and they each received, well, in total, $300,000 in tax returns. We currently have um, classes on Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays from 6 to 8 p.m. On Fridays, we have our literacy class for adult immigrants who never finished their elementary or middle school educations in their native country can do so with the help of our program. This is an individualized program, so clients are in various stages of learning. Upon completion, they receive a certificate from the Mexican Department of Education. We have a partnership with Napa County Mental Health, um, where we have a mental health navigator who comes in for individual appointments with clients who need to speak to someone. Uh, we formed this partnership a year ago, and it's proven to be incredibly successful. Uh, clients who face um, extreme emotional hardships such as domestic violence, depression, or who have a family member who is dealing with these issues have in Puertas Abiertas a safe environment. We are also part of a great collaborative called the One Napa Valley Initiative um, with several other, with three other nonprofits in the area. This initiative was started by the Napa Valley Community Foundation uh, to help legal permanent residents in the Napa Valley become U.S. citizens. Uh, this past May, well, last year, uh, the CEO of the Napa Valley Community Foundation was invited to the White House um, due to the work of the initiative. And I tagged along um, as I served on the board and I'm part of the initiative. And we were uh, very fortunate to meet President Obama. Uh, 
for the past two years, the initiative has assisted over 300 people with their U.S. citizenship, which is incredibly important, especially right now. Uh, Puertas Abiertas is also expanding to provide direct immigration assistance in the next year. Uh, we also have a program called the Abuelitas Program, where Abuelitas, basically senior citizens, have a place to come together as many face isolation. Um, they eat, um, get, get information about various helpful programs, and most of all, they come together to gossip. Um, the goal of our programs is to empower families to make positive changes in their behaviors by accessing social services, uh, improving their educational skills, become more engaged in the community, and by achieving self-sufficiency. As Anne mentioned, we have very strong stories, but it's difficult to track, especially as a community resource center. Um, how do we quantify the betterment of the community in the short term with not a lot of support? It's far easier to quantify how many people received assistance with diabetes management, but we find it difficult to quickly quantify the improvement in someone's life due to increased access to services. Uh, we unfortunately lost uh, a $60,000 grant due to this. Um, they were asking for an evidence-based model, which we used a family resource-based model, but unfortunately the funding went to health-based NGOs um, who have hard data. The HIP tool really came at the right moment in our organization. I, I've been with the organization for the past two years, and the recommendations were um, that we needed to communicate with our stakeholders. Uh, we needed to have better program management. Um, we needed to have project planning and standards. And uh, most of all, that we needed to monitor and evaluate our programs. And that really, really stood out for us um, and our board. In order to rectify this, um, we changed databases. Um, we had a resource resource ACE, which only one person in our organization was able to access on one computer, and it was incredibly um, just an old database, um, which did not prove very helpful um, when we needed numbers quickly. And so now we have Salesforce, which they have a nonprofit um, sector or area that you can use and that has proven to be really, really helpful. Uh, now uh, we're able to access it very quickly, and it's really come down to training staff to use this tool and to really track the people that come in, whether it's through phone calls, whether it's just a walk-in, um, whether it's a one-time service, but to really track these numbers because even though we're very busy and we're very small, we need to have this idea of compiling who is coming into the center. Uh, we also did... Uh, a SWOT exercise, which is strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats, um, exercise with the board and the staff. And what came out of that was to really focus on um, programs that clients want rather than us telling clients what they need. And this has been um, really sort of changing for the organization, and we're currently in this transition uh, because we were focusing on programs that either were um, being multiplied in the community. Uh, so now what we're really focusing on is uh, the Plaza Comunitaria program, which is the literacy program, the mental health um, component, which has proven to be uh, incredibly needed in the community. All our appointments are booked um, every Thursday. Uh, last night we actually had, uh, we collaborated with several other organizations to have a depression and suicide prevention uh, workshop at a middle school because we've had several suicides um, of teens within the past couple of months. And so uh, Puertas has really become a hub uh, for our clients with whatever they may need. And this has been throughout our history, but it's really become within the past couple years that they've really come in for assistance with whatever they may need. And we really serve um, immigrants who have recently arrived in the Napa Valley to those that have been here for several decades. And so we are trying to um, get all the resources available to them. And so the HIP tool uh, was really helpful in terms of 
finding out what we really needed to work on, um, you know, monitoring and evaluation, the data focus and data collection methods, and going into it um, and doing the research was incredibly helpful. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so it looks like Carissa is there. I will unmute her. Carissa, are you there? Oh, it looks like she's still having some technical problems and is now offline. Okay. Um, so maybe what we can do, um, again, as Carissa reconnects, is um, open up the floor for questions a little early. Um, if Carissa is able to get back on the line, there she is. Um, um, I apologize to everybody here for this complication. Um, because really she can speak to the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center and its work around data um, and tracking much better than anybody else. Carissa? Carissa, you should be unmuted now. Are you connected? Can you hear me? Yes, you're a little choppy though. Is it okay if we start with questions, Carissa, and then um, if when your connection is better, you can speak? Hi, can you all hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes, that's perfect. We can hear you much better now. Okay, sorry guys, it just keeps disconnecting. <laughs> um, sorry, I've been having technical issues. Um, well, so should I go ahead and get started or did you guys want to go to questions? No, no, please get started while we still have you on the mic. <laughs> sorry, okay. Um, so my name is Chris Miranda. I'm from the New Mexico Art Law Center and we're here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We provide legal services to low-income in immigrant families. Um, and in particular, a lot of our work focuses on making sure that our legal services are not just one-sided. One so usually when we take on a case, we don't want to just um, provide legal services and stop there. A lot of the forms of immigration relief that are available to many um, folks um, allow them to also receive or also have access to um, Health, um, health benefits as well, which it can be really huge for families. Um, and so while we were piloting the, uh, or while we were in the process of doing the SDH program, um, it was a really great opportunity for us to determine the gaps in our program. Um, we're a really young organization. We've only been around for about five years. And when you first start a nonprofit organization, different folks have different approaches. Um, for starting an organization, and it's all, I, I think oftentimes when nonprofits are started, it's with good intention, um, but um, good intention can only get you so far. As um, Denise was mentioning earlier, data is one way to move towards action, and this is very, very true in the world that we live in, especially in the nonprofit world. Um, you might assume that your work is doing great, um, or your work is improving the community that you're in, but data really actually is a way for you to prove that, for you to concretely show that. And funders want to know that your work is actually taking you to the lengths that you, uh, that they hope that you're um, taking. And you don't want to make assumptions and assume that all of this work is doing great when it might not actually be the case. So it's really helpful for you to not only take this data but reevaluate um, every year and taking the, uh, or as part of the SDH program, we realized that we weren't doing this. Um, I mean, we were collecting data, but it was very much on the responsive end. Um, and I think one of the things that um, it showed is we actually had an analysis with 
other groups and we kind of saw across the board that a lot of our organizations, not just ours, but several other organizations in the pilot program were in the same situation. Um, it was. It seemed like a lot of us were more responsive to the funders. What do the funders need after the fact? And not necessarily thinking about, okay, being more proactive about data, seeing how our work really is involved in the community. So the H SDH pilot program really helped us determine that. And so, um, I mean, we, at the end of the day, we can just do work, um, but we need to also show that the work is being effective. And so some of our results whenever we did the SDH pilot program were um, that we weren't um, taking in enough data, both um, quantitative and qualitative. Um, we were also needing to start collecting more mission impact data to making sure that we're tracking data that is in line with our mission, that we were needing to engage our staff in a self-assessment, and we were needing to have goals that um, to make sure that our program was on track to being successful. Um, and we needed realistic and incremental goals. And one of the great things about the database is not only did we, after we take, take the survey, we realize all of these results, it also gave us a start for resources on how to get, um, how to take these results and put them in action. And so the database was a really great um, start for us because we were able to look up different programs or different and have access to all of these different materials um, to be able to get started on making sure that we were working for the better. Since that time, um, it's been about a year since that time, um, what we've started to do um, is we have a few working groups that have taken on various tasks um, as part of the as part of the results or uh, taking various tasks to better our organization based on the results that we receive from the survey. And so we've made some changes in our program. We're actually having a working on, and we've already started a very robust evaluation process um, that wasn't there before. And there have been a lot of things that kind of have um, come from this. Um, so it really put into light what changes we needed to make, and it gave us a good starting point, and now we've, um, we've definitely expanded our work since then. Um, so yeah, that was, that's pretty much, um, it's, been, it's been a great program to get started and to an analyze what NMILC is doing and how we are in relation to other nonprofits and how we can improve ourselves as an organization, because um, there's always room for improvement, and so having this tool um, show us exactly where we needed to improve um, has been very helpful for us. Thanks, Carissa. Um, so now, and I'm, I'm just so glad that your audio worked um, right, when it, right when it was supposed to. Um, so now we're going to open it up for questions. Um, we have about 10 minutes left on our hour, um, but so everybody is aware, you know, Denise already provided her, her contact information. Um, I'm happy to share other contact information um, from the panelists if um, people who are working in this space want to hear more about NMILC or Puertas Abiertas. Um, but in the meantime, if you would like, for the attendees, um, if you would like to either type questions into your chat box or raise your hand, we can unmute you and you can ask your question. Give everybody a few minutes to think. Great, so I see a question coming through. Kenneth, okay, so Kenneth is asking a question. How exactly does the tool track qualitative data? Um, I, I can take a stab at that, and um, then Cassandra, if you want to jump in. Um, so the tool itself is a way to show um, nonprofits where um, their areas of opportunity are in terms of quantitative and qualitative data collection and communication. So the tool itself does not actually um, provide a mechanism for nonprofits um, to sort of 
you know, enter their data and use the, the, R, the HIP tool to track it. But what it does do is provide them with a framework seeing where their, their greatest areas of opportunity are, and then it's up to each um, organization to be able to track um, what they're doing to the best of their abilities. Um, the tool, our tool, what we're looking at in, at HIP is um, changes in nonprofit capacity over time. So we're able to see, um, you know, as organizations progress and take um, take the organizational capacity assessment survey multiple times, um, we're able to track and follow that. Um, is that helpful, Cassandra? Do you have anything else to add? No, I think that's an excellent overview um, of the tool and, and the fact that it's really focused on awareness and uh, general ability and, and, and realization that qualitative data is, is as important as quantitative data uh, and shouldn't be forgotten. Thank you. Um, and then Maria Elena says, Thank you for the tool. Oh, that's great, Maria Lana. Um, and I hope that it's something that that you and the organizations that that you work with and collaborate with um, find it useful, um, and find it something that that you can really take advantage of. So John Sandoval has a question: Is it possible to see samples of the results or findings of the tool in action? I'm having a hard time understanding what the tool does. Yes. So John, um, we have a, a brief um, at Hispanics and Philanthropy that looks at the pilot. Um, the, the tool really looks to measure organizational capacity in terms of data collection and data communication. Um, that means different things because different grassroots nonprofits um, have different programs and different ways that they currently collect and track their data. Um, and as several of the panelists mentioned, many of that is in response to funders and not necessarily as a result um, of, of really um, supporting their own programmatic work and activity. What we wanted to do is to provide nonprofits with an easy to use tool that shows them where they are, gives them resources to do better in data and data communications, and then um, allows them to see and track their improvements. So John, um, at HIP, and I'm really happy to, to connect with you off the webinar to walk through the tool with you um, and to, to go through it with you. Is that helpful? Thank you. Great. Um, Cassandra or Denise, do you do either of you have any comments? Because I think that this um, this differentiation is a really good one because you know many times online databases um, look to just collect information and not necessarily track nonprofit development. Um, I'm unmuting both of you in case you have any uh, comments to John's question. No? Okay. I think um, the key in, in any kind of capacity assessment activity uh, is that it's a self-reflective process that you do over time uh, to understand where you stand in respect of a certain um, goal or in respect of certain um, tools or, or activities that you need to put in place to really further your mission in the long term. So um, it, it's really about this, the tracking. Uh, are you deepening uh, those organizational areas that, that you need uh, to actually push your mission further. Uh, so it's really more of a self-reflective process about um, competencies, about the tools you have available in your organization uh, to, to look at data, uh, about, about the, the skills that your, the individuals in your organization have uh, uh, to use the data. So it's much more of a self-reflective process uh, and tool rather than something that's going to uh, 
immediately improve the, the state of, of your data and the data capacity that your organization has. And this is Denise. So I would add to that, for organizations that don't yet have the capacity to collect data or track their own data, I really encourage you to go to some of those resources that I highlighted earlier, such as County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, for example, um, and go to the ourcultureofhealth.org website because you can see examples where some of our, um, we call them Culture of Health Prize winners, which you can learn more about and I'd be happy to share. Um, they actually use those existing tools to see how their community ranked in terms of health, different factors compared to other communities, and then they that, that helped them to prioritize what areas they needed to focus on in their own community. And some of them, you know, with minimal resources, they just pulled together and they ultimately became some of our prize winners, our prize winners because um, they were able to use data that existed that was already being collected to inform their own prior strategy going forward. So I would just encourage you to, to look into um, existing data resources that exist even if your organization doesn't yet have the capacity to collect and track your own data. Yeah, that's a great point, Denise. It's a really, <laughs> really great point. Does anybody else have any questions? And again, you know, feel free to raise your hand. We can unmute you. You don't just have to type into the question box to try and, you know, make this conversation at least a little more dynamic. It's always the hard part with webinars. And again, um, you know, just to remind everybody, we're, this webinar has been recorded, um, and we're going to be posting it on HIP's YouTube channel and, um, and sharing it with, with our networks um, and with all of the registered attendees. So we're also um, happy to share um, the brief that I mentioned about, to, to John's question about what does the tool do, um, looking at this, this pilot group and um, Puertas Abiertas and uh, the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center are just two examples, but um, we had 15 different nonprofits um, in the U.S., Latino -led, small Latino-led, Latino-serving grassroots organizations pilot the tools, um, and we were able to see um, a marked increase in their collective capacity um, to, to use and, and collect and communicate their data. So we're happy to share that with everybody as well. So we're at the hour, um, and if there are no more questions, um, we will end. Um, I just really want to thank the panel um, to Denise, Cassandra, Carissa, and Melissa um, really for making this a really interesting conversation. Um, thanks to everybody who attended for taking the time. Um, we hope that you are able to um, use and understand this tool and many of the resources that Denise mentioned as well. Um, and again, at HIP, we're more than happy to help out um, with some technical assistance if, if the tool is something that you're interested in, but um, you still want to have a little bit of an orientation. Um, so thank you so much to everybody, um, and we look forward to, con to continuing the conversation.